really appreciate you um, and welcome to MCD for those of you who haven't been here. If you have any questions after the meeting, I'm happy to hang out, tour you about, and uh, let you see what's going on. So, welcome. Excellent. What time do we have? All right. It is oh, okay. Well, it's 103, and I'd like to call this um, Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District Budget Committee and Board Work Session meeting to order. Um, I'm Steve Fancher, the board chair, and Wendy, can we do roll call? Yes, uh, Nancy Hendrickson. I see You're you, here. Nancy. Steve Fancher. Here. Eric Mueller. Here. Dave Ripma. I think he's joining online, right? He was here. No, he's, oh, he's here. here. Okay, great. We will. Daniyama. Here. Curly Craddock. Present. Roy Segman. Here. Ann Gravit. Here. here. Thanks, Ann. Corky Folio. Here. James Allison. Um, there he is. Here. Mary Helen Kincaid is not on yet. Oh, there she is. She needs to be admitted. Annie Stephenson. Here. Eric Molander. Here. Janelle Bell. Not heard anything from Janelle. Ed Washington. Here. Bob Salinger. Bob online. Sure. Okay. So thank you all. Um, great uh, attendance for such a beautiful early August uh, day. Uh, vacation season is upon us. I'd like to um, ask folks that are here but not part of the board to introduce yourself as well, just because we're all here together and be nice to make sure that we got names to faces. And Colin, can we start with you and then go around this way? Hi, Colin Irwin, uh, uh, Director of Planning Public Affairs at FCD. Mark Wilcox, uh, Project Manager. Hi, I'm Matt Berlin, uh, recently hired emergency planner. Amber Aaron is project manager and planner on FCD. Um, okay. Emily Robinson, joined the transition manager. We also have some folks probably online. Um, if you don't mind uh, unmuting and introducing yourself, um, I don't know how we can do this orderly, but. Um, <laughs> Wendy, do you want to call? If you see people, can you call on them? So um, I wonder if the staff could step up to the table to introduce themselves. There was a comment from the people online that they couldn't hear. Yes. Staff, oh, shoot. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no. You guys get to go again. I wasn't paying attention. That, that was just practice. Oh, okay. That was good <laughs> practice. <laughs> but you need to go <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, this is Amber Ayers, project manager and planner with MCDD. Can you hear us? Great. They can't see you, right? I think you might want to walk. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Berlin. I'm a recently hired emergency planner, project manager. Thanks. Hello, Mark Wilcox. I'm your uh, friendly neighborhood uh, project manager for the PMLS feasibility study uh, most of the time. <laughs> Hi, Evan Mitchell, uh, Public Affairs and Communications. Hey, um, Astor Moulton, Public Affairs Community Relations Specialist. Hi, McKenna Bell. I'm on the engineering team. Hello, Colin Rowan, uh, Director of Planning and Public Affairs. Howdy. And I'm Carrie Sanderman, the Environmental Program Manager. And I'm Wendy Lynn, the Board Coordinator. Fortunately or not, you all know me. <laughs> <laughs> I 
So when it, Andrew. Yeah, hi, I'm Andrew Riggs. I'm a senior engineering technician <laughs> on the engineering team here at MCBD. Thanks. Bailey? Hi, everyone. My name is Bailey. I am the new communications and outreach intern. Cindy. Hi, Mindy Weimer, engineering associate with the district. Janet. Hi, I'm Janet Olson, finance manager with MCDD. Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Rowe, budget manager, MCDD. Great, and uh, Tracy, can you introduce yourself? Boss Tracy. There she is. Hi, HR at MCDD. Nice to see you all. I have a couple um, guests as well. Uh, from Amber, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Ante Amber Ontiveros from Ontiveros and Associates. Uh, I'm your equity consultant. And Isabel? Hi, everybody. I'm Isabel Kennedy, uh, also with Ontiveros and Associates, um, working with Amber on the equity work. And Tara. Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Wilkinson. I'm co-director at the Intertwine Alliance, and I've been working particularly with Carrie um, on a convening of our partners, the environmental sector, plus um, August 25th to talk to do some education about the new district and talk about some of the talk about and get some feedback on the proposed services. Thanks for having me here. Sarah. Hey everybody, Sarah O'Brien with Willamette Partnership, um, working with the Echo Northwest team on the revenue strategy as, as consultants. That's everybody. All right, uh, great attendance, thank you. And before I turn it over to Jim to talk about revenue structure update, I'll just say I really appreciate that um, we're getting into the meat of a very difficult part of this, which is determining how we're gonna pay for this district. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, that there, there's a lot of chicken and egg kind of dilemmas that we run into as we start to, to tackle this discussion. So I uh, appreciate everybody's patience and understanding as we, um, as we daylight the information that I think we all need to, to really um, move this ball forward. So Jim, you wanna take it away? Yeah, great. Uh, up? Um, I'm gonna uh, disenfranchise our chair. All right. Okay. Uh, well, first, I am here to set up Carrie's presentation on flood safety in the environment, but most importantly, I am here to try and explain to you, first of all, that we heard you at your last meeting, that you are very interested in getting into some cost information. Darn operations team doing work out there. Uh, so we heard you, we know you're hungry to dig into the cost impacts. Um, so next slide, please, two, just one, just one slide, okay. So why, why are we talking about programs when you guys wanna talk about costs? Um, particularly today and over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be hitting you with some program related information. And the reason for that is we really want and need your direction as our board before we can deliver to you some viable proposed scenarios for our program and cost options. As you know, without pretty significant investment in our system, Flood landowners in the floodplain could end up getting remapped and end up needing to buy flood insurance if they can get it. And if they can't get it, it's gonna be really expensive. So we, we have some big investments we need to make, first to keep our community safe, but also to avoid some really gnarly financial impacts for uh, our community. Um, don't even get me started about the thousand year rain events that are happening all over the country. If you haven't read the news about St. Louis or Kentucky, I really encourage you to go look because our system would really struggle with that kind of rainfall. And you all know that the legacy districts, the four, including MCDD, really lack the financial resources to make the kinds of investments we need to make to avoid those bad outcomes. So next slide. We are fortunate that the legislature in its wisdom with a lot of support from the community created you all, the Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District. And your enabling legislation sets out eight things 
that collectively we need to take care of. And uh, let's just take a quick second to look at those. I'm not gonna read them to you, next slide. These are the first ones. And again, I'll just let you review them. Um, the tattoos come after the meeting where we're gonna get you all these. Let's go to the next one, catch the last handful of those. So these are the things we have to get done. One more? No, okay. Um, so in addition to giving you the broad mission outline for this new entity, the legislature was actually very specific in giving you as the initial board a very clear purpose. Next slide, please. And I'm actually gonna read this because I think it, it provides some pretty important context to what we need to do in the next few months or years. Um, the purpose of the initial district board, that would be you, is to organize the district and to develop and approve or seek approval from the electors of methods of funding the operations of the district. So again, your job is the methods of funding and the organization, right? Not the programs necessarily, but you need some program information to figure out that. Y'all have done a ton of work on organizing the district and I'm here to say thank you. I know it's been a slog. Um, I hear from a lot of board members that, man, I know there's a big startup cost, but this is not what I signed up for. I wanna get into the meat of this. But um, I'm super sympathetic to that. As you recall, and I think my first week on the job, I decided we could get this done in a year. Um, I was wrong. Um, it's gonna take a little more time, but I'm anxious to get it done too because we need to get the community to be safe. Um, so we're gonna move on to cost here, but there's a step we're gonna take. Fortunately, when it comes to the flood safety system, we know a lot. We have over hundred years of experience managing the flood safety system. We've gone through a huge analysis through the Levy Ready Columbia and the Portland Metropolitan Levy Study. So when it comes to flood safety, we have a rock solid plan. So next slide. The result of the PMLS and the result of Levy Ready Columbia and our 100 years of history is we have a specific list of capital projects aimed at increasing the reliability and capacity of our system, uh, creating an increased level of protection across the floodplain and maintaining our federal certification and accreditation so we don't need to buy flood insurance. We know what we're doing when it comes to the capital investments on flood safety. All told, those investments are likely to cost around $170 million. They're focused on hard solutions to raising levees, replacing and strengthening levees, and increasing the capacity and resilience of our pump stations. A vast percentage of the work we're gonna do over the next 10 years is aimed specifically at capital solutions for flood safety. Fortunately, we're on track to get almost $100 million or more from the federal government. We're also on track to get about $4 million from the state of Oregon to help with the local share of that, to get the design work going on these projects. And I think there's gonna be opportunities for us, for us to ask for more resources from the state and the federal government in the future. So they're helping out. Takes the bite out of the local costs. But we also have some new mandates. Next slide. And I'm not gonna read these because I think you know what they are and we showed them to you a second ago, but I put them up there for your review because this is the place where we have less experience. We have less direction from 100 years of service with elected boards. Right? We're, we're not sure exactly how to proceed with some of these things. So beginning today, we're gonna to start sharing your staff's best thinking about how we can implement these mandates consistent with our flood safety mission. And we're also gonna be asking you for feedback uh, to inform the work of preparing some scenarios for you that we hope to bring you this fall that will incorporate the cost impacts on the local community and different members of the community. Next slide. Steve referenced the chicken and egg problem. Um, I wanna connect the program related feedback we seek from you to the direction you gave us at the last meeting. Uh, it really is a classic chicken and egg problem. Your professional staff really wants to know how much resource they have to work with before they can tell you what we can deliver. And as board members and fiscal agents of the communities you represent, you really wanna know what the costs are gonna be before you can tell us what we can program. We're stuck a little bit, right? So I think we all know as grownups and people who probably wandered around the public sector at least a little bit over the years, that we gotta attack this problem from both ends. Right. We need to iterate to get to a place where we can uh, understand what things are going to cost and that we can meet our needs and really provide the solutions that our community has asked us to provide. So based on what we heard, next slide, I think, um, we are going to produce as your staff three scenarios 
by this fall. Those scenarios, based on your what we heard from you at your last meeting, will include operating revenues of 25, 30, and 35 million dollars, respectively, and corresponding capital investments through a general obligation bond of 100, 125, and 150 million dollars. Along the way, as we're pulling those together, we're gonna to share our progress, both on the program side and on the costing side with you at these meetings. And candidly, we're gonna probably be doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with each of you and in small groups. For example, we have some conversations set up with City of Portland staff. We're working with the Port of Portland to get something set up. We've set up something with Metro. Um, we're talking to Tani and, and Dave and others about East County so that we can really sit down together in an environment where it's safe and we can talk about these things and, and make sure people get the information they need. We want you, yeah. Sorry to enter. Is it okay to ask a question? Yeah. Um, just for everyone's benefit, would it be helpful in a elevator speech way to, to explain kind of why we landed in these, in these ranges? Um, sure. I mean, Go ahead. Yeah, so we currently operate with a budget of about $15 million a year across the four districts. You're shaking your head. What if our assessment revenues for the four districts are about? Ben? Six million for MCDD, 300,000 for PEN1, 900,000 for PEN2, 900,000 for SDIC. So order of magnitude about 8.1 million. Yeah, and then we get almost a million from the city of Portland for influx stormwater. We have our service IGAs with the Port of Portland and secondary IGAs with the city of Portland. We receive grant revenue. We have a capital loan. Uh, so all told. Are those all project or ongoing revenue streams? Um, both. Both, yeah. I think, I mean, Eric, I think that one of the things that when we look at this initial 25 million, that's three, million, three times what the assessment revenue is today. And as we think about our funding sources, I'd like to get a better understanding of how many of those are gonna be continuing. So 8 million plus, a million bucks for stormwater from the city plus whatever. How many of those are project related and will ultimately go away when the project is done? And then that way we can have sort of a base to say, if nothing else happens, other than the existing assessment schedule, this is the revenue that we have to begin with. Then from that point, with the additional revenue coming from the broader district, what could or should that be? Because I looked at the 25 number and I said, that's three times what we get in assessment revenue today. There's gotta be more behind it. Yeah. So I'd like a little bit more detail on, on that. Excellent feedback and exactly the kind of direction we're looking for as we build out these scenarios, because we want to bring them back to you so that they answer your questions. And again, maybe I should rephrase it. We, we're spending approximately 15 million. Okay. And I guess what I would point out is that that's inadequate, which is why we're all assembled here today. <laughs> We've not had adequate resources to take care or invest in our system. And that's why we need to go to voters for all this money. It's why the legislature had to create the new district. So whatever level we're spending today is insufficient. That's why you're here. Um, so anyway, along the way, as we're starting to- There is a question. question. Sorry, Nancy. There's so many yeah, I'm just, I just, just want to, uh, yeah, I just want to reiterate that, well, not reiterate, iterate. Uh, I want to recognize that this is the range we gave the staff last meeting, 25 to 35. I appreciate those questions, um, and I'm also, also looking forward to learning more, but um, I also appreciate that you're acting on our suggestion from just last, until last time we met a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and I think, I think providing that level of detail is going to be important, so, you know, can we... We calculated what we spend and we can break that out for you. Um, and I know that the port and the city would enjoy you knowing how much extra money they're sending to us every year for the services we provide. Come speak into the microphone, Jim. People are having trouble hearing you. Thank you. Um, this is really new. I'm like, um, okay, so we're going to try and daylight all this stuff for you along the way and meet with you so you have the information you need. But I want to also remind you and, and, uh, Eric, I think you raise a, a, a legitimate point that um, this range of costs is very preliminary. It's a planning estimate to try and help refine the policymaking. 
Um, and I'll just give you one example. We've been trying to figure out how we're gonna collect this revenue. And some of the partners we've been talking with have suggested that we need to contemplate spending several million dollars a year just on the mailing and postage alone. And that we can expect uh, a terminal collection rate of about 80% of the revenue that we actually bill. So you're gonna to have to build in some of that loss and some of those expenses into your, your revenue estimates. And because we can no longer use the property tax bill, we're gonna to have to find a whole new way of doing it. There's gonna be costs associated with that. And we're just learning what those might be. So again, I wanna stress that as your staff, we reserve the right to revise and extend our marks, remarks on these numbers, okay? But we are providing them to you to help start to frame the debate and drive us forward so we can share information effectively with stakeholders. So with those caveats um, and recognizing that this is a proposed cost range that marks a starting point of a discussion, uh, not an ending point, we wanna to begin today with a, a conversation to get your feedback on uh, environment and flood safety. And uh, I am happy to answer more questions now. We have a little bit more time. Um, I do really think it will be valuable for this board to give Carrie a lot of time and to make sure you guys have time to discuss this. And there's going to be many opportunities for us to address this revenue question. So if you have a burning question, please ask. Um, if you feel like it could wait a day or two, put it in the chat. Um, and then just know that your staff will be available to you to answer as many questions as you have about this as we walk through it. And again, my objective today for all of our benefit is to make sure we have adequate time uh, for Carrie to go over our best thinking about how we can integrate some of the environmental benefit mandates into our flood safety work um, and to give you a robust chance to, to communicate with each other about that and give us some feedback. And with that, I'll stop. Just real quick, Jim, on the geo bond. So mentioned we've got about 170 million in capital just to get the levies kind of the place where they can be yeah, certified. The, the PMLS and FEMA is, I'm looking to mark, but that's ballpark, right? And you've got about 100 million um, coming from outside sources. So that leaves about 70. Uh, is the remainder, the 30 to 80, um, to take care of uh, deferred kind of maintenance stuff that's that's not happened, replacement of existing assets? What What's, what's, the remainder of that geo bond. So main expenses to implement the non-PMLS FEMA certification projects. And then there are a variety of other capital needs that the district has. And that's why there's a range because it's going to be up to you how many of those you want to tackle with an initial bond. Those ranges, Colin, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're in the seven to nine cents a thousand range for this district um, on those ranges, just to give you again a sense of what we're talking about at that level from 100 to 100. Councilor Craddock. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the effort to have the you know, host this hybrid meeting. I know it's, it's difficult, so thank you very much. Um, the, the question I, I will have, I don't need an immediate uh, response by any means, is I, I assume that staff, you will be reviewing with us these three scenarios and what, what are the pros and cons of each scenario? Is, is that correct? Will, will you get into the more detail about if we choose the 25, 30, 35, or the 100, 125, or 150, what, what, is, what do we get for that? And uh, what, when, or what might not we get if we choose one of those scenarios over another? I, I assume you're prepared for that. I just wanna confirm that. Well, aside from looking younger and feeling better with any of these scenarios, uh, no, we, we are going to be working carefully with uh, Metro, with the port, with all of you to design these scenarios ideally so that they provide the information that you're looking for. One challenge is going to be the level of specificity around the programming because we, for example, Carrie's going to talk about this more, Carrie, I don't want to step on your lines, but we're going to have to do a watershed plan to actually identify the environmental projects, right? Um, we're going to develop a capital improvement program proposal with detailed information and a future board is going to approve that CIP and approve in a, a budget to fund those after appropriate staff evaluation and detail, right? And what we're asked, what your charges, what your purpose is to the legislature is to provide that next board, the elected board with enough revenue to be able to meet its mission, right? We can't give you really fine grained details yet because we're running the current system. We don't have adequate staff or dollars to do the level of planning to give you the detail, right? This is the chicken and egg problem once again, right? 
your purpose is the broad revenue model. The elected board's purpose will be to develop the specific program, drive the watershed plan, drive the CIP, and drive those fundamental budget decisions and authorize the appropriations to implement individual projects. That makes sense? Okay, other questions? <clears throat> If there are none or they occur to you later, I think you all have my email and number. I would love to get as many questions as you have. I'd be happy to come see you um, and have coffee or lunch. We have another one, James. I apologize. I know I should be holding my questions. This is more of a comment. Um, this is just what's on my mind based on where I work. So I work for a basically a public utility and I, I work on the capital side that's supposed to deliver 110, $140 million of capital work per year. And we struggle on the planning, prioritization and strategy side. So it, I don't know if this is helpful to the board, but it's helpful to me to think about our initial um, work may be to um, help uh, put forward a lower number for capital initially as long as we're investing in the uh, operating and administrative resources such that the integration of staff function, the um, prioritization, the, the planning effort that leads to good priorities and future capital investments is done in a really good way. So we hand that over to the next board. I just, it helps me with this chicken and egg conversation, it helps me to remember that, um, the key here, at least for me, is making sure that the new district has the resources it needs to do good planning. And the districts have done good planning heretofore, but it's gonna be a little bit more complex going forward. Other comments or questions, and then I can wrap it up and turn it over to Carrie. I guess the last thing I wanna say, and I've gotten some good feedback recently from a couple of board members, is that um, there is also, uh, there is work that has been done on the environment. There's work that's been done on equity. Uh, and so we're not starting from zero and staff is doing its best to make sure that we make good use of uh, past work. Being new, there are some things that I'm learning about <laughs> that we've done in the past that I don't know. But I want to assure you that some of the work, particularly the legacy board members who are on the urban board are aware of, that, that staff is trying to make the most of those past investments. Some of the stakeholder work around environmental priorities, the work on the equity framework was all done by MCDD staff and we've carried that over. Uh, we have great work around cultural resources that we're aware of that we use every day when we're disturbing soil, right? So again, there's a lot of background that, that is coming to bear on this. And what you're hearing from us today is really the new things, the gaps and where we need to invest uh, to build on those past investments that the legacy boards have made. So um, if there are no more questions, I'm looking both directions. I'd, I'd love to get Carrie started um, for her presentation and then the, the conversation that I hope will uh, be fruitful afterwards. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the direction. Like it, it was helpful to throw down a marker and at least get us started on that. It was very helpful. So, I have until I reach the podium. Uh, questions. Okay. Hello, virtual, virtual people, real people in virtual spaces. Um, this is great. Thank you. Yeah, let me. So, can I go backwards? Do I have to right click if I do want to go? I'll try not to. I will go backwards. Okay. Okay. Don't um, break it. I know. <laughs> That's what I want to make sure that I do. Uh, do not do. Uh -uh. Well, thank, thanks, Jim. That was a great setup. So we're going to be spending the rest of this meeting time talking about program strategies, talking about the, the what do you get for your money so that we get your high-level feedback on the activities, the type of work that the new district is doing and what it looks like to integrate the new mandates. And so this is gonna inform, as Jim mentioned, the cost estimates that, that go behind those revenue scenarios that, that we showed you. And you'll see a number of these presentations over the next month and a half related to other program areas, related to equity, related to cultural history, emergency management, our staff support services. So this is the first uh, of a number and we'll also learn what it is uh, that we can do to best support you in these uh, through this conversation. 
And this image to me represents a little bit of what we're trying to do today. You know, we are looking to the horizon together uh, and staff have spent some time doing this and now we need to make sure that it's lining up with what you see. I'm a, I'm a hiker and a backpacker and I pretty much always stick to trails. I often have a hiking book that says, you know, when you cross the river, you're turning right, uh, you're going to go on a trail, 214, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't have that for, for this part of our work. Uh, we don't have a well-worn path between here and there. So what we need to do is kind of look together and get the sideboards from you all. You know, we're, we're headed towards that pass and we wanna keep the ridge on our right and we wanna keep the river on our left. And that way, you know, we're headed in the same direction. So uh, as I heard it said, we're talking compass bearing, not turn by turn directions. And we're gonna be sharing these strategies and looking for you uh, to give us that, those high level sideboards and, and feedback. I'll cover briefly why we're bringing environment and flood safety to together. That's been a question that came up as we posited this series. What we do today and where those gaps are, some of which Jim alluded to. And then I think the real meat of it is what does it look like to integrate the new mandates? The majority of that will be about what does it look like to integrate flood safety and the environment? And then we'll also talk about cultural history and equity. But as I mentioned, those uh, topics will have their own full program presentations. And then we're gonna have a discussion. We'll pause for some clarifying questions as a large group, and then we're gonna break up into smaller groups. So the time we have left after this, we'll spend about half of it in groups to three or four talking about these questions. And then the other half coming back together so that everyone hears what other folks were saying, but we wanna give you some space to chew on these things. You know, to say what resonates, this is, you know, it doesn't always come up, right? What did you expect to hear that you did hear that you liked? Uh, what additional strategies should we consider? Red flags or concerns? And then are these the ideas that help us build a coalition, that help us build the kind of broad public support that we will need for the revenue requests uh, that Jim was describing in a, for instance, general obligation bond. Uh, so these are the things to kind of keep turning in your head as I'm talking and that you'll get a good amount of time uh, to talk with your fellow board members and all together about. Uh, Jim hit this pretty well. So this was my slide just to remember that the strategic planning, you know, I'm saying things like, we want your feedback on programs. Uh, but to clarify that we're not making decisions about programs or about policy today, the elected board will do the strategic planning, the watershed planning, they'll be doing the turn-by-turn the -turn directions. Um, and what we're doing is, um, to our best understanding, thinking about what are the resources they're going to need uh, to do that and to make that, that journey. And if I take my hiking metaphor too far, you can flag me down at some point. Um, Where's the trail mix? Yeah, right? What's the trail mix? What are the boots? No, I won't, I won't go that far. And we're bringing you these two topics together and generally because we are proposing to take an integrated approach. The Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District exists and today the drainage districts exist to provide flood safety services flood safety and flood risk reduction will remain first and foremost a, a very high priority for this agency. And we have six total purposes within ORS 550. And so where it's consistent with flood safety, it makes sense to us. It's an efficient use of public resources to do more than one thing at a time. That's why we're thinking about integration. We also know that the public, that our voters really resonate and understand the environmentally centered messages like some of what you'll hear today. And we know that it's consistent with best practices in floodplain management. So for those who were able to hear Marjorie Wolf's presentation two weeks ago, this is one of the slides. If you weren't, you know, that will be posted on our website. We definitely encourage you as a really informative of an award-winning floodplain management project. And I like it because you see 
the economy, you see residential spaces, you see spaces that people occupy that can also fill up with water during big rain events to provide flood reduction. And then every other day of the week in the year, they're providing water quality benefits, fish and wildlife and habitat and landscape resilience benefits. So this is really where the sector frankly already is, but definitely is going, is integrated projects and integrating strategies in public spaces. Today, we are oops, the local sponsor of a federally authorized levy system and a big chunk, I have, that's just verbal muscle memory at this point, I think, a local sponsor of a federally authorized levy system. So today, the work that we do on levy maintenance and repair is uh, very tied to that designation. You can see in the top photo here, mowing the levees. That's part of the annual work that we do, as well as inspections and repairs from what we might find. That could be as small as a, a fire pit uh, dug by a camper, as large as a section of bank that's left into the river during a high water event. We inspect, maintain, repair the levees to US Army Corps standards. And some of those more detailed inspections and surveys led to our understanding of the levees reliability that um, in turn led to the Portland Metro levy study and some of the urgent capital needs we've been talking about. Another huge chunk of our work is keeping water moving, uh, what we call our conveyance system, which is a really diverse and dynamic set of ways that we keep water moving. With the levees in place, Rainwater cannot, in all of our watershed, hit the ground and then make its way to the Columbia River and out to the ocean without our help. And so it moves through ditches, canals, sloughs, culverts, pump stations, you know, to get from entering our system out to the lower slough and, or directly out to the Columbia. And there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that that can happen. So the image on the bottom left there, that's a platform, it's part of our uh, dish safety and efficiency program so that the operations crew can walk out on it and rake debris away from the culverts and keep water moving through the system. And on the right side is a very large and automated version of a similar thing. Uh, it's right behind those of us who are here in headquarters at pump station one, because when we turn our pumps on and we move all of those thousands of gallons of water, we also pull in a lot of debris and those are our trash rates that help move it up and out. Colin, how long would it take that pump station to fill an Olympic size swimming pool? <laughs> a little over a minute. Okay. A little over a minute for <clears throat> just that pump station and that image alone. And so our crew, our engineering team, our project managers um, in various roles are keeping those ditches clear of big trees, other debris that will block them. They're keeping grates clear. They're uh, working on the design and installation of trash rake systems and maintaining pumps and replacing uh, pumps. And our environmental program is supporting those two. All of those things, all of our work happens in this space, which is a state waterway, a federal waterway. We have some uh, threatened and endangered species. We have a complex and overlapping set of environmental regulatory programs that are important for us to work with. So our environmental program is part of navigating those expertly and maintaining relationships with our partner regulatory agencies. Another piece of our environmental program is using natural resource management to achieve flood safety. Uh, the example I love of this is weeds. Everybody knows weeds, right? They uninvited, they take over, and that happens in the slough. Aquatic weeds form big, dense mats that come up against these pump stations and can clog the pumps. They make them work a lot harder. They can reduce the usable life of our pump stations. And so we work in partnership with Portland Bureau of Environmental Services to treat those. And these are invasive aquatic weeds. They're non-native species. And in so doing, we extend the life of our pumps. We reduce the work for our operations crew and we improve water quality and habitat for the fish and wildlife in the slough. So those are the kind of strategies that I mean when I say, you know, we have an opportunity to use natural resource management uh, to help achieve our flood safety goals. 
So we do this really well. We've been doing this for over 100 years, as Jim mentioned, and as he also mentioned, we know we have gaps. So I'll try not to double up on some of these, but these are some of the things that have inspired the formation of the new district. And I'm proud to say that we have been thinking about and are working on all of these things uh, to some extent, right? We're getting ready. We know we don't have the resources to complete this work, uh, but these are all on our workloads and on our minds. The urgent capital needs, the development of an asset management approach has been underway for a number of years that helps us get ahead of our maintenance and repair so we fix and maintain things before they break. Creating safe and reliable access. Our crew, you saw that platform, right? Imagine that's a curved pipe and it's slippery and it's raining. Right? Our crew needs to be able to get out to the places they do their work and do it safely. Our levels of service are our conversation, our expectations, for ourselves that we deliver to our, to our constituents, to our ratepayers, what can they expect of us? And we know that we need to continue to think about what happens when we have bigger, more intense, more frequent storms that we can expect with uh, the impacts of climate change. So that's one piece or two pieces, I suppose, of what we're seeing when we look through our binoculars and when we think about what are the activities of the new district? These are things we need to continue to do if we want to keep our homes and businesses and roadways you know, dry and reduce flood risk for our community. And the next piece is gonna be how do we integrate those new strategies? I do this all the time, I bring notes and then I don't look at them. Um, so the strategies that you will be hearing about have been developed with in partnership with our operations, our planning, our engineering team. And they're also things that we've been hearing from the public and uh, hearing from our stakeholders about for a long time. So as Jim said, these aren't coming, you know, this is not coming from nowhere. And from the development of the bill that turned into our enabling legislation to a report where we interviewed over 20 organizations that care about the environment and justice issues in a slew workshops with our stakeholders to identify different project opportunities is that map you see on the bottom, individual conversations with you all, and the continuing opportunities for stakeholder input like Tara mentioned at the, the beginning of the discussion here. So let's dive in. We'll start with levies. When we look through our binoculars, when we think about what are the activities of the future districts, we continue to be the local sponsor of the federally authorized levy system, we continue to make those Portland Metro levy study investments. That's a just smaller version of the image Jim showed before on the top. And we integrate opportunities where consistent with our flood safety goals to bring in more native vegetation and shallow water habitat. What you see in this image on the bottom, you see that existing levee as a prism that we do not encroach on, right? That's part of the Army Corps certification. That's part of providing a technical level of flood protection. But in what we call overbuild areas, things above and beyond, we have more flexibility to use native plants, to use uh, habitat features, say woody debris and other things uh, on the outside. There's places that we already have this overbuild um, near Salmon Creek, uh, out on the east side of the district, where we, you know, there are opportunities today. We also could potentially add overbuild areas. One good example of that is that there's places in what's currently Pen 2 where the levee is very steep and it's hard for operations to do their work. If we were to put in a bench for them to access those areas, we would have an overbuild and could integrate habitat features like these. Also in the bottom, we were started thinking about, but we'd love to expand um, the use of pollinator friendly seed mixes, additional flowers and habitat features for the essentially grasslands that we have on our levees. For our conveyance system, for the ways we move water, we would continue doing that maintenance of our pump stations, of our ditches, canals, and sloughs, doing that kind of invasive species, that's the, the weed management I discussed, 
And then we would look for opportunities to enhance our flood safety system with the strategies that are at the bottom here. When I say work with natural hydrology, I mean, look for cases where we can let water flow downhill, uh, right? Where we can, if it does not uh, increase flood risk, any gallon less we can pump is money we can save. Places where we can increase natural flood storage and habitat, those are around our canals and our ditches. Where can we have a slightly wider stream corridor, put in floodplain benches so that we have habitat features and more storage for water to move through. And while there are a number of locations where our crew needs to get down and needs a path to access the waterway in everywhere else, uh, there are opportunities, or there may be opportunities to increase the revegetation in the native plants uh, around our ditches and sloughs, as well as planting trees uh, throughout the district because trees are just amazing multitaskers. Uh, in heavily paved areas, you get water coming faster and more of it into your system during a rainstorm. The more tree canopy, the more native vegetation that we have, uh, the more of a buffer we get from those high peaks. I want to acknowledge there are places due to the airports where tree planting is not going to be in front of you. Hold on a second, <laughs> There you are. <laughs> Yes, and there are places Hi, where big areas of open water, again, particularly near the uh, airport. I, have, I don't know how to mute the team, the meeting on Zoom. <laughs> I will mute, Janet. We'll mute you. Okay, gotcha. Do you feel so powerful being able to mute people? I love it. That's gotta be true. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carrie, would you be able to repeat the question? Because um, I, I didn't hear most of that. I don't think there was a question. Uh, Jim oh. had mentioned, Jim was adding some nuance around kind of reflecting that we do have different local priorities within our area. Like for instance, in an airport, um, we, there may be places where, you know, tree planting is not appropriate or where open water areas are not appropriate uh, because of the way they attract waterfowl. So just recognizing, and, and actually it's a great lead in to talking about the watershed improvement plan. Uh, that we're not saying all of these things everywhere all of the time. You know, the watershed improvement plan is required by our legislation, and it's that venue to give us the specific plan, the step, the kind of turn by turn directions and say, where are the good opportunities to do this work? You know, where can we get the best bang for our buck in terms of these mandates? And can we evaluate this on a whole, ensure that we are supporting our flood safety mission? This is planning work that we do in other areas. We do conveyance master planning. We have the asset management program. And so we're adding to the portfolio of uh, important uh, planning exercises that support delivering these projects. And a couple other things I want to hit on about the watershed improvement plan, it specifically calls for us to coordinate with the plans of the other jurisdictions in our area. Um, I mean, we would, we would be fools not to, right? We have these amazing government organizations and agencies, and we want to align uh, our priorities and understand where there's places for mutual benefit. Kind of think, no matter how much uh, revenue the new district has, we, we can't achieve what we're looking to achieve by ourselves, and nor should we. And that extends from the government agencies to our nonprofit partners and to our community organization partners. This uh, planning exercise is where we can find those areas of overlapping interests and the areas to leverage each other's strengths. So I've spent a lot of time on the integration of flood safety in the environment. I wanna spend a just a few minutes on how we imagine what we see for integrating climate adaptation and equity and social justice, um, which you'll hear more about. But we know that we need to plan for larger, longer, more intense storms. And I think if, you know, in the flooding in, in Kentucky and, and St. Louis, um, and so many of those other stories that we've read and heard over the last few years also tells us that we can, we should also plan for the possibility that our system could be overwhelmed. 
and bring in strategies like redundancy and resiliency. So I think of what we do right now as resistance, right? We are pushing the water back or we're resisting the floods. And redundancy is about having backups, like the capacity for our pump stations to connect to generators. Resiliency is about bouncing back or bouncing forward. And the green infrastructure strategies, the improvements to our waterways and, and wetlands, those are naturally very resilient. Nature is really good at bouncing back. And oh, sorry. hold on a second, we got some feedback. Again? Okay. And especially places like wetlands and floodplains, these are natural systems that are adapted to disturbance and change. They are they're intrinsically good at bouncing back. And in terms of uh, integrating our climate, our uh, climate mandate, we also want to think about the way that we operate, what our impacts are, and what our vulnerabilities are uh, to the conditions we're likely to face. Electric vehicles, getting our computer servers out of the floodplain, for example. And we've been doing it this these last few weeks and having these really hot days. We still we have work that we need to get done. We have extreme temperatures and we need to keep our, our crew safe. So where are the other places we can anticipate that we're going to need to, to adapt um, and be ready for those more extreme events. So this is my last slide uh, related to integrating equity and cultural history. Uh, I'm myself also really looking forward to hearing uh, the program uh, description about that. And so what I wanna emphasize at this point is that one of the big tie-ins I think that I see is the relationships and partnerships that we build with the nonprofits, with our community, with our community organization that extend and that become partnerships from start to finish, from planning to implementation. You know, when we have and when we are in conversation with our community and particularly with those who have been left out of, are most vulnerable to, have been most impacted by the decisions in the past, then we can find those natural opportunities to achieve all of our goals together. And we can find those spaces um, to leverage each other and support each other in achieving our goals. When a, one example of a possibility here is, I mentioned flood storage restoration. So wetlands are a great way to enhance natural flood storage there. Nature's sponges, they fill up, they um, can drain back down. And in uh, for the tribes and indigenous urban communities, first foods are those foods that have been traditionally harvested since time immemorial. Those are, in some cases, plant species that we can integrate into a wetland design or we can work directly um, with groups to design how those first food plants are put into that and find if it's safe for, uh, from a public health standpoint, opportunities for the harvest of those species as well. So there's a lot of examples like that where we can, um, we're doing something that provides flood safety benefit, that meets our objectives, and we have a great opportunity to partner. That's the end of the content that I have for you. Uh, we're gonna have some, a few minutes for questions here. This is specifically around clarifying, making sure you understood what you heard. Um, we'll believe that there is way more content behind just about anything here. So there's a lot more detail that we can talk about here or in emails. Uh, and then we will, Wendy will help us uh, break into groups for that small group discussion. Questions? Not really a question. I'll just say for me, um, it was a great presentation. I think uh, it really helped summarize kind of all of the different areas that we're looking at that are really outside of the current um, duties of the, the districts and kind of what those challenges may be. 
the devil's in the details as far as exactly what we do in each of those areas that will dictate cost and roll up into what the, the overall budget needs are for the new district. Um, so that that's the that's the fun and challenging work as we dive into those areas, um, I think. So your challenge in the next half hour is to try and determine, you know, give us some direction so that at the different scenario funding levels, we've incorporated the things that are important to you or we've removed the things that you can't, right? So, so let me begin with that. Um, when we talk about the watershed improvement plan, who is responsible for pollution remediation? Ourselves, EPA, City of Portland, BES. It will depend. Okay, so again, setting up guardrails, what will it depend on? Let me give an example. If we turn over dirt to build a new levy and we discover something, it's on us, right? right. And or so the underlying landowner, if it's got a history and we can tie it back if it becomes a super fun site. If we're fixing the bridge to the levee, it's our responsibility to ensure we need the uh, course Clean Water Act permit authorization, as an example. So again, it will depend on the specific circumstance, but typically there would be a mechanism if there's what we're likely to find if we find anything, and we have a lot of data that suggests we're not going to find anything where we're working. Thank you, Mark. Um, but if we happen to come upon something, it's likely to be petroleum. And, you know, again, we may have some obligations there in our current thing, but we'd also be working with Hong and others to look for who put the petroleum there in the first place. It wasn't us. Right. So right. who's responsible for cleaning up mercury in the Columbia Slope? Uh, a bunch of people because there's a new TMDL, a total maximum daily load. So we are obligated under that to look at our operations to try and minimize impacts of uh, mercury. Uh, we don't produce mercury, but we transmit it or we stir it up in the sediments by our discharges. So we're looking for ways to minimize the, the loosing of mercury into the water column by changing our discharges. And I, so I guess I the actual cleanup is somebody else's responsibility. Right, unless we spill mercury somewhere. Yeah. Or, yeah, we're not we're not proposing one of the strategies or priorities you didn't no, hear. No, but we're setting up guardrails. We're saying to, what yeah. are we responsible for? What's well, safety and the other mandates right. to contribute to right. and other things, right? But we don't have a new uh, sort of toxic cleanup priority. But as a responsible government agency, if we come upon something, we're gonna call in our allies. Correct. Right. Out. right. So so that that's really clear. When we talk about wildlife management programs, again as part of our integrated watershed improvement, who's responsible for the Western painted turn on the peninsula pond? Is it us or PPNR? Yeah, I guess I think it's a, a interesting way of phrasing the question who's responsible for. So certainly there's legal frameworks that say what we're responsible for when we're making changes, when we're doing things through our operations. We're not proposing to take on uh, any sort of legal responsibility um, or specific right. so, objective, so but again, we are identifying that we have opportunities to improve habitat for the Western Painted Turtle uh, when we're doing flood safety operations, when we're installing, um, you know, that we may have opportunities to improve habitat. But I, I feel like that's different than saying that we take responsibility for. Right, and so that's a do no harm kind of proposal. And I think that again, thinking about setting parameters um, the first thing is do no harm. And if we do, we have to remediate it, but we're not responsible for improving that. That's really PPNR. Our manager says that we should contribute to improvements in water quality, fish and wildlife habitat, landscape resilience. And yeah, but, restoration. but again, here's, here's but the issue. Different we keep it. coming back to where's that dividing line between ourselves and PPNR. That will be determined over decades in litigation, right? And, and I'd like to say that the legislature pointed that to you, and you're making the initial policy call on how much investment you want to make that contribute to clause and what that what investment is necessary to build a coalition to generate the revenue we need to do our flood safety mission. Okay, so again, a really fuzzy boundary. Absolutely. So I get the first do no harm, and I, I completely agree with that. 
when we think about um, the wa watershed improvement plan, we currently have one that is um, being undertaken by the city of Portland. Right, so City of Portland, Vista, yeah. I think you the question on the chat Portland Parks and Recreation. That's what you, when you say PP, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and so, why do we think that we're going to come up with a different plan than the City of Portland? We don't. We think that we're going to use the watershed improvement plan as an opportunity to identify our priorities and goals as it relates to the environmental mandates and that we're going to do that by understanding and considering the goals and plans of the overlapping jurisdictions and identifying areas uh, where we can collaborate uh, within the priorities that we've set in that plan. Got it. This is actually what we've always done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's three three hands up so, online. Yeah, we've got some questions online. Eric, did you get... All right, did you, I've got a lot more. Okay, but. we'll follow back up around. Who was the first one online? James. Okay, James, you're up. Uh, thank you. Um, for starters, uh, great presentation. Um, I, I have a, a number of comments, but I don't want to make them now. I have a uh, question about where we're at on the agenda. I believe, are we doing breakout rooms? Or are we going to have just one one discussion around, do, around the four questions? Yeah, we're going to do breakout rooms. So the intention was just clarifying questions right now, um, but we're going to have, uh, so we have mm, 40 minutes. We'll do 20 minutes in breakout groups and then 20 minutes all back together. So there'll be another opportunity. I think right now is what do you need to know or what does everyone need to know in order to go have the conversation around those discussion questions. Oh, lost it. Okay. Yeah. What's up next? Uh, Nancy. Aunt Nancy. Mary Helen. Okay, we can. We're both pointing at each other. Only my hand was off the screen. So, um, my quest clarifying question before I comment is how we are integrating what already exists in watershed plans, cultural resource plans, cultural history plans that many agencies are undertaking. And the other question is, is there a MCDD staff person on the interstate replacement bridge, any of those many committees that they have? Um, I know Ed Washington is on the cultural resource advisory committee, but is any staff involved because of the work that they're doing, which would um, might overlap? Maybe Bob knows a little more about it, um, Bob Salinger. And so I, I think that would impact some of the work and my ability to answer what kind of policy we have for programs if we're reinventing the wheel on some of the programs and projects that we already have. Um, Mary Helen, I'm going to tackle the easier part of that first. So in terms of the interstate bridge uh, replacement project, we are not serving on any of the community advisory committees, but we do have a sort of special working group that's set up directly with the program managers and we meet with them at least quarterly, sometimes more than quarterly, depending on where they are in their process to talk about what they're working on and then have you know, ad hoc meetings, depending on the topic to talk about issues related, you know, it, the equity work that, that they're doing, the cultural history work that they're doing. Um, but our main focus in our sort of working group that we have with them is making sure that their plans don't impact the levies so that they can, or that we, we plan accordingly so that they can go through their certification or 408 permitting process with the core. So we want to make sure we get what we need and help them get what they need when they need to go to the court to get permitted. And then I'll so take a oh. um, crack because I think we could also probably follow up with Evan on the interstate bridge if there's more yeah, that you yeah. want to talk about on that. Um, but to your other question, Mary Helen, about integrating what's already been done, been done I, I, I think we're trying very hard not to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, this slide that I offered 
that talked about a few of the stakeholder engagement and resources that have come into this presentation was specific to the flood safety and environment components. You know, the cultural history discussion is coming up and that'll be, uh, I think a better place to talk about specific past uh, activities or endeavors in that subject area and how they're being carried forward. Um, but we are, have, have heard and are considering, and I think I could speak in, in detail uh, more later about the specific sort of reactions that we've had to what we've heard in the past uh, and are continuing to do that. And, and the, the plan is that on through the, the watershed improvement plan, which will really be that where the more detail comes in. Um, and where we may be able to see a little bit more clearly the places that were intentionally overlapping or not doing things that other people are doing or acting upon the, you know, the plans or recommendations of, of other efforts that were uh, high level at this point. Okay. I only asked that because it was in your slides um, about cultural history. And so it sounded like you were including it now, but want to talk about it later. And so I don't know how I can comment on something that you're mentioning now, but say, wait till later to respond or hear more. Uh, and, and that was my trouble. But Mary Helen, really quick, before we go to Nancy, I just want to say something at a higher level, just and, 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 make, and have you react, I guess. When it comes to water quality or watershed planning or any of these things we're talking about, they were set in the, the, by the legislation to be part of this new district, but the degree to which we go beyond what's already out there, for example, with watershed planning being done by Portland or Gresham, that's a board decision. That's why we're here. And it's why the, the next board is gonna make decisions about how far they go. Let's remind ourselves of that. Staff didn't choose to put these elements into the charge of the district that was set by the legislation. Now we need to figure out as a, as a district, as a board, what that's gonna cost, what level of effort we're putting into each of those things. So we're asking a lot of questions now of staff of how much are we gonna do? How far above and beyond are we gonna go? They don't know the answer to that. That's, that's, that's on us. So I just wanna remind us of that. Yeah, okay, Nancy? thanks. And yeah, I'll just say, um, just I'm new to this board. Um, some people don't know me, um, but I've been working on the Columbia Slough for 20 years. And I work for the city of Portland, BES, and watershed plans have been my bread and butter over the years. Also lots of collaboration and stuff. The way that I'm looking at the questions today in terms of the presentation and um, the four prompts we have to talk about is I want this levy system to be up and running 100 years from now, 200 years from now. And that means we're facing climate change. We have to think really strategically. I mean, we've got the Army Corps plan for the next 10, 20, 30, who knows, so many years, and we have to fix that now. But um, we got to start working a little bit more with nature than against it. I think that's one of the, um, that this expanded mandate gives us um, more freedom to do that. And so things like, uh, you know, buffers that will keep the stream banks from crumbling in. Um, Carrie had a lot of nice examples. There are watershed plans that the city has, city of Portland has done. There's also a watershed plan that the watershed council has done. Gresham may have a watershed plan. Sandy may have a watershed plan, but they're different geographies and they're gonna have also a different set of mandates. I would say the one chain, the one big difference in the watershed plan that the Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District comes up with, not this year, not next year, but whenever that new board gets elected and sets the staff going, will be have flood safety as a focus and maintaining things, having them be resilient, redundant, sustainable over the long term. So that's it. Um, I, I heard what you were saying, Eric, um, and Mary Helen and Carrie, and that's my take on how to do the conversation over the next hour, less, whatever it is. Um, really think about the long view, how we incorporate these things in the work we need to do. And our district is gonna have flood safety at the center 
and everything else will connect to it. And well, there's a lot of connections with how you manage water, how it heats up, how it gets full of weeds, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of things that the drainage, that the current and new district will have connections to water quality and habitat and all that stuff. And so being able to um, think about ways we can still get our work done while also improving that, I think that's a win-win. Thanks, Nancy. Let's play. Again, if the board wants a different approach, we just have, our experience suggests that you guys have better conversations in smaller groups. But again, we want to respect your desires as the policymakers of our organization. Uh, we don't need to push you into a format you don't like. Ask a question before we jump into the groups. So there are four discussion questions listed. What resonates? Are there additional strategies we should consider? Do you have concerns? Are there ideas that help us build a coalition? That's a lot to get through in a short amount of time. So I'm just wondering, is there a priority question that you would like us to tackle? Or are there questions that the board thinks are, are equally or more important that we need to discuss and give you feedback on before we jump out in the breakout? I think what we're looking for is any sense of collective priority you have on integrating environmental benefit into flood safety, right? Because that will guide us into what we bring you in the scenarios we'll share in the fall. And these other questions really help you con contextualize that, right? Because we need to be consistent with what other people are doing, and we do need a coalition of support for the revenue and the bond. So can you reiterate that collective benefit of incorporating the environmental into collective our work? Collective perspective on what the most important things are to candidly help us build the coalition to get the revenue we need. Yeah. Or that you'll all hate the same amount. I don't know, right? <laughs> just we we don't want to bring you, we don't want to be way outside of the, the bullseye here. We want to be close. Right? We may not hit the bullseye, but we want to be on the dartboard. So what Evan said that folks on the uh, virtual meeting might not have heard is that we want to bring you scenarios that you like. Or that, that reflects some sense of direction. Or if you guys are all over the map, we need you to know you're all over the map. So when we bring you something that cuts off, you know why, right? We're not ignoring you. We're saying the bell curve of you, 17 of you is in here somewhere, right? We don't know that yet because we haven't heard from you. And we're, we're kind of shooting in the dark without that direction. So that's what we're after. So Wendy, can you guide us? Yeah, to the group? I'd like to invite, invite uh, Corky, Canny, uh, and Eric Molander to uh, join Dave and Colin out on the patio. I'm going to open the break. <laughs> so those of you online should be invited. Um, yeah, just I think with your mask and stuff. We have yeah, he know, he knows. We have 15 minutes left. Um, and this is a time to hear what y'all were discussing in your group. So it would be great if we could uh, get a board member from each of the discussion groups to get some of the points that were discussed, some of the, you did each have a note taker, so we do have more detailed notes. Uh, it doesn't, not everything necessarily needs to, to be repeated for staff to hear it, um, but would love to hear a bit about what you were discussing and what came up for you before we close the meeting. So happy to take volunteers and in maybe five or 10 seconds, I'll, I'll pick a group uh, if you don't see I volunteered to be the report back for our group, so I'm happy to do that, but I'm also happy to ref defer to a board member as you suggested. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. So I had a group uh, with James Allison, Mary Helen Kincaid, and Nancy Hendrickson. Um, just, I'm gonna share a really short sort of what resonates and then kind of lump the rest of them together. A lot of support for the wetlands and equity work that you described, Carrie, of the appreciation of the expanded mandate and the opportunity that creates for us for coalition building. Um, 
uh, mention especially kudos the idea of having large wood in the slough that doesn't affect levy operation is a really cool example um, and uh, uh, an excitement or trust of staff that they'll make good use of expand of existing plans and and partner jurisdictions um, and modernizing the multi -bit to the multi benefit approach. Um, kind of concerns and additional strategies is is a little bit more, I think, of the make sure that we're leaning on existing plans and experts. We know where our level of service is. We know where our, where the gaps and, and our niche are and where we're in, um, to Eric's point, more of a supporting role. Um, uh, uh, one one person mentioned uh, wanting more of an emphasis on strong buffers so we don't end up in an armoring situ situation, a uh, bank armoring situation that would be more expensive and unpleasant. Um, and I've got a number more that I, I think you you may not want me to go into any greater detail, but I think this idea of sort of going down the path over the next few years and especially starting with the watershed plan of um, of defining objectives, defining level of service, defining roles and responsibilities, um, and and making sure that that we're not either leaving gaps or being redundant with um, the work of other jurisdictions came up a lot, and some urgency to get to the cultural history conversation as we had in the large group conversation as well, and and really wanting to know, to your point, Jim, at the beginning of the conversation, I think when does the rubber hit the road, and and kind of in a little a little friendly impatience with the high level conversation and wanting wanting to get to the nuts and bolts. Group, how did I do? Is there something you oh, and appreciation of staff actually, and some comments sent right as we were leaving the um, the, uh, the the breakout group room there, recognizing okay. that you all have a broad mandate to try to figure out how to implement. Thank you, Sarah. And how about our other online breakout group? Uh, I think we elected Bob to summarize what we talked about. Wonderful. I think I think I heard my name there. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, oh right. So, Bob, can we call him out? Uh, yes, Esther suggested that you were elected as the spokesperson and uh, could provide some summary of your discussion. Yep. Uh, so, so yes, we had a four-person group with Esther and, and uh, Ann and, and Councillor Craddock, um, myself. I, in general, um, we, we, really, we liked the presentation. We thought staff did a really nice job on the presentation and laying it out. Um, there, I think there was general enthusiasm for the way that we're headed. Uh, there was a lot of interest in, um, you know, how uh, we fund this, how we interact with other uh, plans and groups um, uh, and, and be inclusive as, as to how we do that. And that's going to be a necessary component of um, making this work. Um, there was uh, uh, interest in um, basically... Uh, a recognition that um, there is a, uh, you know, there's a limited number of tools in order to accomplish this this kind of work. Uh, and um, uh, we've done a lot of work already. We've done a lot of processes, both in the district and outside of the district. Uh, and that this doesn't have to take years or be super complicated, uh, that it may be helpful to go out to the community with a little bit of a straw man or a template that says, you know, these are the kinds of things we're thinking about, like increasing tree canopy, uh, in, increasing um, floodplain uh, connections, um, green streets and eco roofs. You know, these are the kinds of strategies that, you know, we're thinking about uh, the workforce development that can go with that, uh, making sure that that's equitable and inclusive. Uh, that kind of a thing where, although sometimes you make it a little pushback that you, you, you pre-cooked it a little bit, you can jump to really substantive feedback much more quickly of people saying, okay, here's what I like, here's what you missed, here's what you should add. Uh, so, you know, not to necessarily recreate the wheel from the ground up, recognize all the work that has been done. Um, I think there was uh, excitement about the potential for um, uh, the narrative that can go with this uh, to recognize that uh, there's a lot of good work that's been done, but we haven't always really built with nature very well, and we paid a price for that. Uh, so how do we make sure that going forward, 
uh, we really think about the ecological impacts, uh, what natural solutions might be integrated in, and how we can enhance the landscape going forward. Uh, and some ideas were thrown around like, you know, uh, how do we have the greenest flood district in the country, something that would really appeal to the community. Uh, there's a recognition that um, the public really does strongly support this. There's a lot of recent polling that's gone out, including uh, the district and metros that really comes back and shows that the public cares tremendously, even in this incredibly complex time we're in about water quality, uh, habitat, uh, climate resiliency, these things resonate. And as we're going out to the public asking for funds, uh, it, it'll be really important to be able to kind of sell this bigger, more um, exciting vision perhaps. Um, and I think lastly, and, and then tell me what I missed here, uh, also a recognition that obviously uh, flood safety is, is paramount. That's, that's why we exist. And uh, that it will be important in terms of credibility over the long term and the short term to really tie that to it too. That's easy to do uh, because it's all about water. And um, but to really make those connections and uh, be able to really talk articulately about um, you know how this does connect to flood safety and um, uh, why these things make sense, how they serve multiple benefits, but how they also uh, clearly serve flood safety as we go forward. Uh, so what, what, what did I miss there? Nicely done, Bob. I, I don't, I, I, the focus, the, the statement that I was focusing on are these the ideas that help build a coalition, um, you know, that we're going to, we'll be reaching out to multiple coalition groups that are diverse, that look at life differently. Uh, the business organizations, more conservative organizations than on, on one side, and then might be, you know, the environmentalists on the other side. And so each message will probably be slightly different uh, to, uh, and because we're doing it all. Uh, of course, as Bob was saying, the bottom line for this, this organization is safety, to protect those businesses that sit behind this levy, to protect those jobs that sit behind this levy, to protect the people that live behind this levy. Uh, and then, but at the same time, it's to enhance our, our contribution to our environment. And so each organization and uh, group that we will interact with will be focusing on it all, but we'll probably be emphasizing one, one, um, one point over another. And uh, so I obviously we're going to have to be going out to all diverse groups, you know, communities of color, environmental groups, business groups, conservative groups. Um, any group that we can think of and get them involved and start talking about the greater picture. A lot of what this, this organization this um, is going to achieve will be done through possibly our state legislature, through coalitions. So the goals of this agency are large, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're responsible for every detail. We're going to be working uh, with those other organizations and agencies in our legislature to achieve the greater good. And so just because we have some greater goals, that doesn't mean this organization has to do uh, every piece of it. It's going to take us all to, to um, re achieve the goals that we're going to be setting. So that's to me is the message and how we're going to reach out and develop that coalition. Thank you. Um, how about the group that was out on the patio? Okay. Come to the table or grab Pass, the grab. Yeah, Take this one. Okay. Nope. Is this working? Absolutely. All right. Um, I facilitated the group with uh, Tanny Staffinson, Eric Molander, Corky Collier, and Counselor Dave Ripma. Um, and yeah, really focusing in on what resonates and then some of the concerns. So. Uh, what resonates or what was good to see was that in a really reassuring way, there wasn't anything novel. These are things that we have been doing that uh, the drainage districts have experience with or that our partners have experience with. Um, so that that resonated. That was a good thing to see. Uh, we weren't, uh, you know, we're, we're revising, we're renewing, we're expanding, but we're not necessarily creating something that is an unknown. Uh, also, what was good to see was that uh, 
what remains core, flood safety, um, and then really a, a bit of a discussion on where there's some opportunity to take the lead in the region as uh, in, in green infrastructure in particular. And so to provide leadership, um, maybe something echoing what Bob had said about, you know, sort of having that national expertise uh, that we really are able to lead. Something that uh, in that same conversation, uh, kind of taking it to what we uh, there might be concerns about, which was not getting into things like wildlife management, um, instead really leaning on partners or others that have that expertise already. Uh, there was you know, a number thrown out that 95% uh, could be done by those others, and maybe 5% is done by us just to provide that really geographic specific or uh, flood safety specific um, angle to it. Uh, there was also some uh, things that resonated was uh, the idea of really building cost efficient partnerships um, and so making sure that um, we leverage work that has already been done, um, similar to what had been said by other groups, not reinventing the wheel, not just doing planning exercises to do planning exercises, but instead bringing together those plans and projects that have already been identified um, and adding our own uh, pieces to it, but really um, pull together what's already done and really leverage uh, those that are already doing work in the space. Um, yeah, let me see. Uh, and then, yeah, there is also um, a concern about, you know, basically the note saying that uh, being good with the idea of tying um, environmental designs to into designing levies, but having a hard time with the idea of sort of buying votes as in doing uh, particular green infrastructure environmental projects um, because that would get us a certain vote. And so um, I think maybe there's further conversation to be had around how to really lean into that green infrastructure uh, in, in the language of the mandate um, really as being integrated and not as a separate thing. Um, yeah, and then there was also the note just about uh, that we're not kicking anything to the next board. Uh, that there are real decisions around what the revenue structure is, um, decisions that need to be made that will ultimately decide how expansive um, or, or really what the, what the work that this organization will do in the future looks like. Um, so just the importance and the gravity of this work. Um, any of the board members, anything that I missed in there? Thank you. One from the group that was in here. Um, I can take a stab at it. Um, we talked about, we kind of dove into, and this is my fault, <laughs> I think. Uh, we kind of dove into the question around level of effort for um, the environmental kind of aspects of the, the new district and how to determine what those levels should be and what they might cost. And um, so kind of just got a higher level understanding of, of parsing it out further that, that we've got pretty solid understanding of what it costs to bring the levies up for certification. We've got a pretty solid understanding of the asset management piece about how much money needs to be invested in pumps and hard things like that. So we don't need to talk about those today. So we focused on the environmental piece as Jim instructed us to do from the beginning. Um, really, really hard to determine how much should be spent on, on water quality um, components as we do projects, but did get a sense from staff that they've been thinking about that and in the projects that need to be done, um, what kind of level should be considered for um, water quality improvements. And then talking about the watershed planning component of this, um, again, the investment could be very small from the new district if it's just a coordinating role between the city of Portland, Gresham, the, the watershed councils and the planning work that they've done, or it could be quite large if we identify gaps. If there are big gaps in either areas that those plans haven't identified or gaps in the sense of they're, they're just not funded. And I know like for Gresham, we've got plans, but we don't have funding to do what's in those plans. So if this district finds great value in some of those elements that we're not able to fund, then it could pull those in and fund those. And determining what that level is is very difficult because 
chicken and egg. We're not going to be able to do that plan. But uh, uh, Commissioner Stegman brought up that if we got some information from the cities about what that what that planning looks like from Portland and Gresham and about what maybe their funding gaps are, at least it would give us a, a high level um, understanding of what our, our, our exposure could be, right? So maybe there is some work for um, us to do there and bringing more information forward about what those watershed planning efforts are from the various jurisdictions. What did I miss? What did I leave out? There was one point, uh, Ed, that I think you make that was pretty interesting, which is I know we staff heard you say 25, 30, 35. And, and Ed, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but what I heard you say is, well, Steve, you said 20. Um, and, and then Ed, you said, tell us what you need. Give, give us the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, the Portland Christmas tree, and the Charlie Brown Christmas tree being the bare minimum, right? But but don't don't shy away from asking for what you need and then let us argue about that, right? And so so maybe yeah. we need to think a little bit differently outside of that range of numbers and get back to, here's the stuff your expert staff says would be ideal, here's the stuff that's the bare minimum, and here's something maybe that y'all can hate equally. There's one thing that I, um, I'm thinking a lot about why I'm here or why we are here. And um, uh, I'm not here to establish any kind of legacy or anything like that. Um, I'm here because I was told that, that what we are supposed to do is to be able to get this put together to pass it on to the next group. So it has nothing to do with me about what I think it ought to be or should be or this is my idea. That's not why I'm here. Um, we really have the easy job, which is to get it ready and pass it on because I guarantee you those who are going to follow us, it's going to have the tough job, real tough. And I don't, I just don't want to give them a, a hot boiled egg. <laughs> That's the way to say it. To come. <laughs> We give them something good, uh, and that's doable. That's all. I'm finished. Uh, I think our mic batteries are dying, so we're just, oh. uh, sharing them right now. Um, thank you, everyone. This is uh, make sure folks online can hear me. Uh, just really grateful for how much time we've been able to spend on this, and I know that there is a lot more that we can talk about with most people individually and then as a group. Um, but we'll be looking at uh, all the notes from all the different groups, reaching back out to you. Please feel, you know, I haven't called you already, uh, that my door, Jim's door is metaphorically open. Give us a call. Let's, let's talk more about this. The scenarios that resonate with you and those strategies that resonate with you to the revenue scenario figures. Was this helpful to you? Yes. Okay. I think it was, I guess. That but was... I need to process it. Yeah, no, there's too. a lot of things and I kind of need to. At least you think there's enough there to process. So that's I hear yes. you guys are ready to support 40 million in operating. So I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess the other piece that I think would be helpful to, to your staff is as you're thinking about these scenarios, what information do you need to see as a decision maker or to work with your elected stakeholders or other elected stakeholders that you represent here to feel confident that we've given you adequate information? So think about a template that works for you, inform it, we'll be talking to you. And then the last is, we came up with this format to try and engage you and you're a big group with a lot of different interests and different styles. If there's recommendations you have for the future topics that allow you to be more interactive or have a better say in what we're doing, we'd love to hear that too, okay? Can, can I just ask a question? When you said you're gonna to talk to different people and one of the beauties of just our four group and then hearing the other groups is the insights that people had that I had no clue or didn't have the ability to have. And so is there some way to, have a library of those or a collection of those or recording because I mean um, just in mind Nancy mentioned about big wood big wood in the slough I would have never been able to say that or know that or know that that was a benefit 
And so, uh, and I don't know how many other people did. So I, and I know Bob has a lot of experience. Um, Eric Molander made a lot of good comments. And so it would help inform me if I knew what those conversations were, or if you could schedule a time and say, anybody want to talk about this or, um, and participate at will. But, um, and, and that's just me because I feel like I come from a, um, limited point of view of just neighbors on the ground and what I hear from people walking around in my neighborhood. Oh, thank you. Um, we intend to be getting back to you both in small groups as individuals and at every meeting we'll be giving you an update about the information we're hearing both on the, the cost analysis and what you need to see but also on the program development. Uh, it won't be perfect. Um, I don't think we'll be recording things but we will be bringing notes and, and uh, outcomes from those dialogues. We're really interested in having some conversations about what these scenarios need to look like so that you feel comfortable in evaluating a revenue model, right? And again, I want to stress that it, it's not this board's job to get into the specifics of the programs. It's your job to give us the broad outlines of the revenue needed for the elected board to refine the, and implement the programs. So we'll be focusing mostly on what kind of an alternative document do you need to see to feel confident in making a decision? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Personally, I like the idea. Again, it, it goes back to Ed's um, suggestion about looking at the three levels, but looking at them with regard to each of these areas, right? Yeah. Staff bringing the, the board um, some information around what a bare bones, you know, um, program around uh, the watershed planning might be and a more robust might be and having the board go through each of those ancillary elements and saying, somehow coming to a conclusion around where we should be funding each one and then aggregating and seeing where we're at. There's, there's a lot of variables when you do it that way. You've got six programs and three scenarios and three scenarios for each of the six programs. You guys are going to struggle. So go. I don't know how. Ben's fond of saying, keep it simple, uh, but we also know that there are many of you who need to see some detail to feel confident. So, uh, so sorry, you online people. Maybe it's not three, maybe it's two, maybe it's, it's sidebars. Maybe we're looking at, and, and the board's charge is to pick something in between, right? So if it was a, this is an absolute minimum, this is what we're, we're doing today, plus we know we have a mandate and we think the bare bones way to meet that mandate would be to do X. And then here is that with a very, very much enhanced program. Yeah. And then the board somehow picks um, a spot in between. And so th this is why we're looking for your feedback on what you need to see. So if you want ranges for each of the program areas and each alternative, we can do that. I, w I want you to think about how you're going <laughs> to process that as 17 of you. That that's all I'm asking, right? I understand. I just don't know how we're going to get there without doing that. And, and I think it's incumbent on staff, candidly, to propose some things to you for you to react to. Um, and we're going to try and bake in some differences that are clear to you and give you some options to move. Um, ultimately, we're going to have a recommended ordinance, and you guys are going to go through a markup, and that markup will define the sideboards for the different areas of funding, who pays, which geographies, and so on. So you're going to have to go through that. We're hoping it's going to be in the winter time sometime. Right. Ten after. Thank you. Uh, are there any final questions, comments? before we wrap up. Continued appreciation for all of you and your time and support. Appreciate it very, very much. All right. Sounds like we're ready to adjourn. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everybody. Uh, great discussion. Thanks for coming over to the campus. And for those of you who couldn't make it, I hope you'll come next time. Thank you for much. Thanks yeah.